Hey everybody, I'm Joe and we are going to be doing a deep dive into masking in Capture One today. So this is not one of my shorter Capture One in one minute videos. Rather, today I really want to spend some time and look at all of the controls and options we have available for creating and altering masks inside of Capture One. So that's what we are doing right now. So we are going to pull open Capture One here, and today we are spending our time really looking at this, which is the Layers tool. You will find it inside of the Adjust tool tab, but it is also built into the Color tool tab if you use that in your workspace. And I do use it in my workspace, and I do keep the Layers tool open there. And this is where building masks really comes into play. And there are a number of ways to build masks inside of Capture One. And interestingly, not all of them are actually inside of the Layers tool. So let's go ahead and get into it. The first and simplest way to build a mask is with a brush. And so we're going to come over here and just pull out the tools to make sure we can see it. The brush is right here. So if I click on Add, I will automatically add an empty adjustment layer, which means one where I have not selected part of the frame to be in the mask. If I want options, I have a drop down menu right here, and that's going to give me the ability to choose an empty or a filled mask. I also have clone, which is copying pixels, and heal, which is what we use for getting rid of blemishes and dust. We also have, importantly, move background adjustments to new layer. This is a relatively new feature in Capture One, but one that is actually really powerful, and we will be taking a look at that. So for right now, we're going to do an empty adjustment layer, which would be the same as just clicking plus right there. And once we've created a new layer, we get to decide how we are going to mask some pixels into the new layer. So I'm going to click on the brush to start with. But first, I really want to make sure we understand the brush options. If we right click, we're going to see the brush settings. Let's talk about these. The size is, of course, the actual size of the brush. The hardness is the feathering. So if we move that, we're going to see the outer circle get farther or closer away from the rest of the brush. And what's really key here is that this is where the effect is feathered out or done in less and less of a quantity so that your brush effect is more blended into the scene. If I am adding to a mask, I tend to bring the hardness down. But if I, uh, to a to a harder setting, so it's a higher number, uh, but if I am brushing in an effect, I will make this much uh, lower on the scale here, but more feathering, all right? So we're gonna have this here for the moment, and I'll probably bring my size a little bit lower. Opacity is how much we can see through the mask. Now, please note that if I have masked some uh, particular area of the frame, when I have a masked area, I also have an opacity option right here inside of the Layers tool. And we'll be dealing with that as we go along. All right. Then we have Flow. Flow is really important. Flow is the building up of an effect. So if I am brushing in maybe a little bit brighter of an exposure, or a little bit darker of an exposure, I want this lower, somewhere between three and eight. But if I am simply creating a mask and masking an area, I want this to be much higher, which is what I'm going to do for the moment. Then I have the on and off settings. Airbrush is building up opacity, so very similar to simply just spray painting a pane of glass. And as we paint more and more coatings on, we will see through that glass less and less, making it more opaque. If you do your editing using a tablet with a pin that has a pressure setting, then the uh, pin pressure is useful here. I do not have that, and so it doesn't matter for me if it's checked or not. Auto mask is important. Here's the idea. And I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger so you can see. All right, auto masking works like this. I want to determine where the edge of the flower is. And if I have to be really careful coming inside of this flower, it's gonna be very difficult for me to actually edit it. But if I was to have auto mask turn on, then the software is going to determine if there is a pixel difference between the inner circle and the outer circle. 
If there is, then it, de it decides that that is the actual edge of the subject. Let me show you how this works in practice. If I come along uh, the flower here and I let that auto mask, you see how it finds an edge. And with an out of focus subject, it finds an edge that might be a little bit imperfect. If I come to a more in focus area, kind of like here, it finds that edge much more cleanly. And this is going to let me not be as perfect as I move along and try to mask this flower. So other options, brush with layer and eraser with brush. What do these mean? And why are they underneath the term link? So the brush with layer means that if I was to go and edit a sequence of images, I might change my brush settings. I'm using a size of a particular brush right now that is suited to the actual size of the subject that I am working with. And so it makes sense that right now my brush has a certain size, a certain hardness setting, a certain uh, opacity, a certain flow, etc. And all of that is well and good, but if I go to a different image, I might need to adjust those settings. And then if I come back to this, uh, this particular image, my brush would default to whatever the last brush settings were. But I could save my brush settings with the layer so that every time I bring up this layer on this photo, the brush settings are saved. I find that useful. The next one is eraser with brush. What that tells us is that our erasing tool is going to be the same size as our brushing in tool, which makes sense. If we're trying to erase a mistake, then we want our eraser to be similar in size to the regular brush. So for instance, if I was to accidentally come out and add that section to the mask, I would come here and I want you to see this. I would come to the erasing tool right here. And right now that eraser is the same size as my adding in brush. And so I can simply erase that portion of the mask. Now, of course, you might think here that since I have brushed the outside, I'd need to fill it in, but we have options within a mask. Let's take a look at them. If I right click, I could clear the mask and get rid of it. Invert the mask is going to be everything except for what I have brushed. I'm going to do fill mask, which is gonna fill the interior of the outline. So all you have to do is the outline and then you can fill it. Other options, rasterize. Rasterize means lock this mask in place. Now, why would that be really necessary? Well, let me show you a different kind of trick here. Let's say that I wanted to, and let's find an image here. So here, I'm going to reset this edit. So I have an image and one thing I might want to do is make it feel like the sun is coming up uh, and actually warming up part of the sky. We're going to do a radial mask, which means drawing a circle of some form or an oval. Now I could place it, but I might need to move it from one place to another to find the best spot for that effect and this gives me the ability to move it. But some edits to a mask are only possible if we lock its position in place, which is rasterizing. You don't really need to worry about rasterizing all that much because when you need to do it, the software will inform you. If you want to get rid of a particular mask, which I want to do, we highlight it and we hit the minus key right there. Come back to the image we were working on. Okay, what other options do we have? we can refine the edges themselves, which is very helpful. So if I was to do this, I could blur my edge of the mask, which in this case is actually helpful because I have an out of focus subject and this is trying to find those edges better. If I clean this up, it becomes much sharper and you would bring down this radius, which is how far away from the point the mask extends. Uh, you would bring it down for very sharp delineation, but with an out of focus portion of a subject, we want to bring this up and apply it. 
The next thing that we are going to have is Luma Range. Now we're gonna be getting into this in a little bit, but you can get to this in two ways. The first one is here, and the second one is actually right above the names of your layers. Luma Range is right there, which is awesome. And then we have copy mask from. Now you're going to see me do this uh, a number of times because copying a mask from one layer allows you to then utilize it. There is an obvious use case for the copy mask from, and there are some others that are less obvious. Now something we'll get into much later on is saving the adjustments as styles or brushes. And that's going to be a particularly useful thing, but we're gonna get into that later on. But lastly is renaming. And this is last on the list, but it's the first one you should do. Click on it and we can name our mask. Naming your masks is really important because we might get into five, six, seven masks and we want to have a name so we can more smoothly and quickly edit what we want. Now I'm gonna show you a use case for one of those options. I'm gonna add a new mask and right click, copy mask from the flower. But now I'm going to right click and I'm going to invert the mask, which is going to give me everything else. Right click, rename as background. Awesome. So now what I can do that now that I have this actually done is come to my flower. By the way, you're seeing this highlighted at the moment. Let's do a little thing. Press M on the keyboard to see a mask. You're going to see that my color for my mask is blue. But if you go to your settings, which is in one of a couple places, we can come up here. And this is in different places depending on if you have the Mac or PC version. But inside of a Mac, it's under Capture One as Settings. I believe under PCs, it's inside of the file and you'll find Settings. But it's also Command or Control Comma. You'll bring up your settings for Capture One. Underneath appearance, there's mask color, and we could move our mask color to anything we wanted. That's where I changed it. Two little bits of advice. We want this to be a very obvious color, and we don't want the opacity too low. If it's too low, it gets a little bit hard to see the mask area. I think this should be really evident. So I think this should be 50% or above, my personal opinion. But choose whatever is easy for you to see. So since I brought up the opacity, I can see through this area less. That's okay. Now that I have this area, almost any editing thing that I can do is possible only within the mask. So I'd be able to take this and perhaps brighten this a little bit. I'd be able to perhaps take my color saturation and uh, bring that a little bit up. So I'll take saturation and I'll push that a little bit, which I think might be nice. I also might take the color temperature and warm that up. Seems like it'd be nice and we can play around here. I'm gonna show you just a few things. The actual full capacity of editing is something that really is its own video. I just wanna show you how we do the masking. But now I can grab the background and make it a little bit darker, which is always nice. If you wanna see what a particular layer is doing, we can click on and off so we can see the total effect of that layer. The other thing that we can do is what if I have uh, brightened this, but probably a little bit too much. I've added saturation, but probably a little bit too much. But the ratio of all these effects is pretty good. One thing you can do is bring down the opacity of the layer, meaning that I have the ratio of all of the effects that is all together, but I'm just gonna bring down the totality. If you are happy with the type of adjustment, you just think the overall amount is too high, that's the way that you would be able to adjust it. So let's take a look at using a couple other ways of building masks. The first thing that I wanna take a look at is, and we're all looking at it, I know that we all are, this spot of dust right here. We've gotta get rid of that. So I could come to a new heel layer, but there's a faster way. I could come up to my cursor tools and grab the Band-Aid. And just like with anything else that works as a brush, I could use the bracket keys to change the size. I want this a little bit bigger than the spot of dust. I'm gonna come over it and I'm going to grab it. I could grab this point here and this changes the reference point that is used for healing because it is chosen by the computer, but sometimes they choose wrong. Okay, so that's how we do a healing layer. Next thing I'm gonna do with this image is I'm going to do a small crop just to get rid of that small rock there and I'm happier with that. Okay, let's take a look at ways that we might 
edit this image. I want to take a look at the magic brush. The magic brush is going to find similar pixels, which is useful. Now, if I right click, I get different uh, options here. I get the size of the actual brush, which is going to include more or less variety of pixels that are being referenced. The opacity that we see through the mask, and then we have tolerance and refine the edge, which are going to give us how similar of pixels are included in the mask and refining the actual edge in the way that we saw with the regular brush, okay? We can sample the entire photo or only areas that are similar, and then we can make the size of the magic brush similar to the size of the magic eraser, which I do like that. For this, I'm gonna be doing the sky, and so I want to make sure that we're not sampling the entire image. I want it to be localized. That's going to be better for me. Tolerance here, I really want it to be lower because the other pixels surrounding the sky are not similar and so I could bring this up a little bit so that I grab more of the sky on the first pass but if I have other pixels that are slightly similar in color I would bring my tolerance down next thing is going to be the opacity I leave that at hundred percent pretty much all the time and for the size I think that I could come a little bit bigger and I'm just gonna click and drag throughout part of the sky I'm gonna press M so you can see it and that's what it grabs I can click here to add that portion of the mask and I have my sky right click rename sky now let's take a look at some other ways that we might build masks all right, I'm gonna use the exact same thing to grab this area here. So I wanna grab all of that and see what it does. That adds a pretty decent amount. I could grab there. And now if I come in, I want to grab that portion, but my size is probably a little bit too big. And so what I'm going to do is use the bracket keys to shrink this down so that I'm only sampling those pixels and it grabs it. And I have these other areas which I can grab in. Sometimes you get these areas that are somewhat similar and we get them a little bit less in the mask. Some people will use the magic brush to fill those in and sometimes we actually might say oh it's gonna be a little bit faster to grab a regular brush and brush in those areas. You have to make a call based on your particular situation. So I can right click rename as mountain range. So that is using the magic brush. Let's take a look at another way of building a mask. I want to grab all of this greenery and you might think hey you could grab the magic brush and that would be a totally legitimate way to be able to grab this area but I'm going to show you an even easier way. We're going to come to the color tool tab and then to the color editor. This is a way of building a mask that is not inside of the layers tool. I'm going to come to advanced and what I want to do is I want to grab my color picker and grab green and this is going to give me a swath of what I chose and similar colors around it. But I wanna expand this out to look at a lot of green. And I'm gonna make sure that I can see this really well. I'm going to go to View Selected Color Range. Turn that on and everything that is not inside of this pie wedge turns into black and white. Pull this over so we can see the whole image. What I wanna do here is grab all of the green. So I'm gonna drag this until I start seeing something that's not part of the greenery. I know there's some yellows in here and in here. And I'm gonna drag this until I start to see those which is about there, and then pull back. And that's gonna be all the green on that side. Here I'm getting into some aqua tones. I could drag this until I start seeing some blues, and I think that I've got more tolerance here. I'll go to there. This looks really nice, and it's my green area. And of course, inside of the color editor, I'd be able to shift the green to make it a little bit more of a forest green. I could push its saturation. I could brighten it a little bit, but that's not really why I'm here. I'm here because under the color editor, come to the three dots, I could create mask layer from selection. By doing this, I actually get to have an area, press M, and this is all of the greenery with a lot of nuance. Right click, rename as green. So now I have this wonderful greenery section and that's how we can make a mask based on color, which is awesome. All right, so now we have done some edits and we have built masks using a brush, the magic brush, 
and we have built masks based on color. We've erased from masks with a regular eraser. We could use the magic eraser, which is going to work similarly to the magic brush. It is simply going to find similar pixels. But now I want to show you another way of building masks that I find very helpful. What I am going to do here is I am going to go to the background layer. I'm going to really quickly do an exposure, an HDR, and a levels edit. And I don't want to spend too much time on how I'm doing these edits because that really is the subject of a different video. Just know that what I'm doing is editing within the background layer, which is what we do the majority of the time. But after I've done this, I do not want to keep these edits in the background layer. You'll see why in a second. What if I have created a ratio that's really good, like the amount of exposure adjustment is really good with this amount of shadow adjustment and that ties in really well with the levels correction. All those things are in sync with each other. The problem is what if they've gone too far? Well, if I'm in the background layer, I have to go and adjust every slider. That takes too long. Come to the drop down menu, move background adjustments to new layer. Right click, rename, and name this the background or the new background or whatever. The nice thing here is I can take the totality of those adjustments and pull them back at the opacity slider. That is not possible in the true background layer. All right, the next thing we're going to do is take a look at radial adjustments. I showed this to you before, but we are going to do it uh, now for real. I'm gonna create a new layer and come to a radial adjustment. Now, when you do a radial adjustment, we just click and drag and we create a circle or an oval uh, here, and we have three circles. The middle circle is where a mask is applied in its totality. The outer circle is the end of the feathering. The middle uh, circle is where I can rotate it. I can also change its shape. All right, which is very helpful. Grab the inner circle and you can change the feathering amount as you want to. All right, I want to create an effect that the sun is rising and warming up the sky. So I'm gonna place this to where I would think the sun would be in the frame, somewhere like around there. And now what I'm going to do is simply grab my white balance tool and open it up and I'm going to warm that mask. And that's great in the sky, but guess what? It's really terrible on the ground here. So we are going to now remove this area from this mask, which I'm going to right click, rename warm sky. Awesome. The thing to really keep in mind is I could do this in a number of ways. I could do the eraser, of course, and I could erase part of that mask. I could grab the magic eraser and try to find similar pixels. That's another good way. But I'm gonna do this in yet another way, and that is Luma range. You see, I have noticed that the sky is brighter pixels than the ground. So this is the Luma range tool. Let's take a look at it and understand it. First, we have the feathering effect of the Luma range. I have the true zero and true 255 values, but I've actually uh, only feathering those in from the point of 20 points away on either end. Now I could say I want every bright area of pixels. I don't want feathering in the bright areas, and so I could drag that over, all right? That would work just fine. If I bring this in, I could then drag this back out to recreate the feathering. So that's how you can edit that portion. But I am going to take the black area here and pull it back until the ground is gone from the mask. And as we can see, I've removed all of this foreground. Radius is what we've looked at before. Does it feather? Does it not? I think I could feather it a little bit. And sensitivity is how sensitive to this particular brightness value we have. And if you didn't click M on the keyboard to see the mask, you can always do it here, which is helpful. All right, we're gonna apply that. And now press M on the keyboard and we can see that we have added this beautiful sunrise coming in off the uh, off of the area from behind the mountain, which is why it's not affecting our foreground. Love it. Now that should be reflected in the water, so we could do this all over again. I could hit plus and then right click. I could rename warm reflection. I want you to see me do this again. Grab a radial tool and I'd want this to appear from about this area. Grab my center circle, drag it back because I want the feathering to be about like that put it into the area where it would be, and then we're going to warm 
that particular part of the frame, come to Luma Range, and we are going to remove, oh, let's display the mask, remove the water from the masked area. And in this case, we have this little section here. So the question is, does that look correct? And I would say I want to get rid of that. Easiest way, of course, is to grab an eraser and come in and simply remove that from the mask because that's just a rock. It's not actually seeing through to the sky. All right, that is how we do the radial mask. We are now going to build some masks and we're going to do them off of the linear gradient tool. So I have already started uh, some basic adjustments on this image. All I've done is basic background corrections and I'm going to add them to a new layer, right click, rename, background, always want to do that because I can pull them back. This was the starting point. This is where I wound up. That's just basic editing stuff, okay? What I want to do is start bringing in linear gradients. So let's take a look at what linear gradients do. And we're gonna make this into a pretty dramatic scene. I'm not trying to go for realism in this case. I'm gonna grab the linear gradient tool, which is great. And what I'm going to do is start dragging in. And what we see is we have some lines. Press M to see the mask. I can drag this for the feathering effect, of course, which I want this to feather quite a bit. I can rotate here and this is going to be my edge and what I am going to do with this particular one is I want to create something that really has a clash of colors that's happening uh, so what I'm going to do is bring that as my linear right click rename and we'll call this warm and I'm going to come in here and I'm going to warm up that color temperature. Now, do I want to remove the mountains from the mask? I think that I probably do. And so I'm gonna drag these out, but stop about there because I don't wanna remove the ground. If I wanted to come in with a magic tool and erase that, I certainly could. Uh, but that feels pretty good to me. The darker area is where the sunlight coming from that area would not hit, so I feel good. We're gonna do that again just so that you can see it. Add a new mask, linear gradient. I'm gonna come in from this side here, and we're going to cool that color temperature. So we have edited this with linear gradient tools, but now I might want to brush in some effects. Like I'd like to brush in perhaps the sky being a little bit punchier. I might want to brush in something where just the sky is a little bit brighter. And I think I'd like to brush in some brightness and some clarity into the mountains. And so we are going to use a brush tool, but we're gonna use a custom style brush. Let's get into how we make these, how we use them, and how we use them quickly, which is really important. So we are going to start by creating a brand new brush, and we are going to add a new layer, uh, click on the brush tool, and set some settings to the way that we want this brush to work. And so for me, I want this to be relatively big. I want the hardness to be pretty low. The flow, if you're brushing in an effect should be between about three and eight. And for this case, I'm actually going to turn off the auto mask tool. When I'm creating a mask that I'm going to do a lot of intricate layers with, I leave auto mask on. But if I'm brushing in an effect, I turn auto mask off and you might find one or the other works really well for you. Uh, now I'm going to build what I want this brush to do. Well, if I'm gonna be brushing in a dramatic sky, I'm going to probably darken a little bit, let's say by about half a stop or so, punch up some contrast, bring down my black point a significant amount, so minus 23, minus 25, something like that, and I'll probably add in some dehaze. But what I'm going to do is right click and then save adjustments as style brush. So I haven't actually used this yet, importantly. It's gonna give me an adjustment clipboard, which is saying, all right, here's all of the edits. Do you want all of them in the saved brush? I could take out one if I felt that it was not appropriate for the brush, but I'm gonna leave all of these in and I'm going to hit save and I'm going to name this Dramatic Sky. Seems pretty good to me. Now I haven't used it. I'm actually, you could use it right away. I'm not, I wanna show you how we use this for later projects and I'm actually going to delete this mask. I'm gonna come back to my basic background layer so I have nothing going on and I'm going to come to my styles 
and Presets tool tab, and I have added in style brushes. Remember, this I don't believe it's added into this tool tab by default. You can always right click, add tool, and come down, and it'll be right there. So I'm going to open this up, and guess what? Dramatic Sky is right here. I can bring it out, I get my, uh, my brush exactly that I had it, and I'm gonna start brushing in a more dramatic sky. And the effect is going to build up slowly. All right, so that's the mask that I've just brought in. All right, and if I want to actually take a look at what did this do, I'm gonna come over and take a look, and guess what? I have a layer that's been added automatically called Dramatic Sky because it's the name of the brush. I could click this on and off to see what did my brush effect do. It did that. I think that looks cool. Now, I know uh, that I can do a couple things. I'm gonna show you how to use them, then I'll show you how to build them. I'm gonna hit Command-1 on my keyboard, and it's gonna bring up my ability to brighten up an area. And I wanna just lightly brighten up this guy right here. I'll bring down the opacity of the layer so it's not as uh, super evident. Now, how did I do that? I just hit a shortcut. Uh, keystroke and brought up a particular mask. I could come in and I might kind of uh, feather this area, this edge a little bit there and call that pretty good. But how in the world did I do that? Let me show you. If I come back to my style brushes with brightness plus, I have command one. Meaning if I hit command one, I'm going to bring up this brush. Well, how did I make that? And then how do I continue to use these? Let's build a keyboard shortcut for Dramatic Sky. There are two ways to do this. I could right click the brush and hit assign key uh, shortcut. But I'm gonna show you the other way to do this as well. I'm gonna come up here, come to edit, edit keyboard shortcuts. And that's going to bring up my edit keyboard shortcuts menu tool, yay. And under custom shortcuts, I have these. Command one, two, three, four, five, and zero. Zero for me is opening something with Adobe Photoshop, but I also have the other ones as just opening up my favorite style brushes. Let's build a new one. I'm going to hit plus, select style brush, and then any style brush, either built in or custom, is available. Well, I'm gonna choose Dramatic Sky, and now I have to actually just click the keyboard shortcut I want. I'm gonna click Command-6, and there it is. Once I do that, I've created it, and what I can do is come to any other image that I want, and I want you to see this as it happens. Hit Command-6, and I'm going to start brushing, and it immediately uh, brings in the exact same brush, and guess what? It builds the layer right there. I use these all the time in order to brighten up an area, to darken an area, etc. So let's just see me do this one more time. The clarity and brightness should be Command-5. Bring that up, and now I'm going to brighten and add some clarity to the mountain range right there. That is the masked area. I'll add that a little bit add that a little bit, and that's the effect I really wanted out of it. And I could just connect those two areas right there, so that feels a little bit more natural that he's at that point. Now, all I really need to do with this image is go to my cropping tool, come to unconstrained, I think, bring these up and around, and then bring this into a panorama, and that's the image that I've been able to create. Why on your keyboard, we can see before and after, before, after. All right, so this has been our look at how to do all things masking with Capture One. This is how we create them, this is how we utilize them, and how we can start modifying our image and editing the exact part of the frame that we want. Thank you for joining me today. YouTube's made out of buttons. Press some of them. I'll see you next time.